Well, today we're going to talk about the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. We're going to talk about um, injury, mechanism of injury, prevention, and management. So we'll go through the background, some of the anatomy, uh, presentation, clinical presentation, uh, management, and prevention. So quickly, there are over 250,000 ACL injuries in a given year uh, in the United States. The majority are um, in ages, athletes of between the age of 16 and 45 years old. And there's a marked increase in the last 20 years. And that's thought to be uh, due to the increase in sport participation uh, in the middle age, uh, adolescent, and female population. The highest risk sports uh, involved are football, basketball, soccer, uh, volleyball, and team handball. And there's a 2.4 to 9.5 uh, time increase, uh, increase in women compared to men uh, in uh, many of these sports. So what are the risk factors associated um, with having an ACL injury? Uh, there's certainly a hormonal component. Uh, estrogen has been uh, related. Uh, anatomic, the size of the ACL itself, the notch, uh, and I'll show you that in the anatomy. Alignment, uh, laxity, and flexibility. Uh, there are environmental factors, including the playing style, the shoe surface uh, and uh, interface, the uneven playing surface. And probably most importantly is the neuromuscular factors that are the quadricep to hamstring ratio. Uh, and there are many studies uh, that have been done, but this one uh, done at Columbia uh, by Dr. Ahmad uh, really looked at the effect of gender uh, and maturity on the quadricep to hamstring ratio. Uh, and they noted that females after menarche increase their quadricep um, more so than their hamstring, and thus their prevention um, should really focus on uh, changing this ratio and increasing their hamstring strength. So quickly to look at the anatomy, this is the femur and the tibia, uh, quickly, and we have the ACL going from the tibia to the femur, and then we have the PCL behind it. Uh, there are other ligaments in the knee that are often as, uh, have associated injuries. You have the MCL on the uh, inside here, and you have the LCL on the outside. And right within the joint, you have the lateral and the medial menisci, which are commonly uh, injured. The menis the, uh, ACL itself has two bundles. There's an anterior medial bundle and a posterior lateral bundle. And the anterior medial bundle is taut or tight in flexion, and the posterior lateral is taut in extension. So what's the common clinical presentation of an ACL? It's often low velocity, uh, deceleration, most commonly non-contact. The mechanism of injury is a valgus external rotation uh, injury with hyperextension. Uh, patients, athletes will often complain of hearing a snap or a pop uh, and a giving way. If a hemarthrosis or blood within the joint um, is present, there's a 72% chance that that's an ACL injury or that's part, a component of the injury. The other associated injuries um, can be meniscal tears, up to 62%. Uh, osteochondral fractures and other multi-ligament injuries including the PCL, MCL, or LCL. Video analysis looking at the mechanism of injury shows that patients who tend to have them have a more upright position, there's less flexion of the hip and knee, uh, they have a straight back, there's a forward momentum, and there's excessive knee valgus. And these are all things that we will look at in the preventative aspect. So the mechanism of injury, as you can see in these uh, few diagrams, you can see the external rotation, you can see the valgus, and then here you can see the hyperextension of the knee. So, in that video, you could see the hyperextension of that knee and could anticipate the, uh, the injury uh, from watching that. So, how do we examine a patient after an injury? And the exam is different if it's on the field or if it's a day later or two weeks later in the office, depending on the amount of swelling. First thing always is inspection and palpation. Where is the, pain, the patient tender? range of motion, and then there are specific tests that we do to look at the ACL itself, the Lachman in the anterior drawer, uh, and the pivot shift, and I'll show you examples of all of those. And this here is a picture of what's called a KT-1000, and that allows us to uh, accur accurately measure the anterior translation of the tibia compared to the contralateral side, and as uh, Dr. Cohen said, you need to make sure that you ask a history and that their uh, other side is normal, so you have an accurate um, comparison. So here's an exam, example of the Lachman uh, test where you're causing the anterior translation of the tibia on the femur, and that's uh, abnormal. 
This is the anterior drawer. You're doing the same thing where you're seeing the anterior translation of the tibia uh, on the femur. And when the ACL is intact, that doesn't happen. And the last is the pivot shift. Yeah. It's a little bit more subtle to see. But what you're actually seeing is when the knee flexes up into approximately 30 degrees of flexion, that IT band is causing a posterior force uh, on the tibia and reducing it. Um, and again, if the ACL is intact, that doesn't happen. And so the next step after we have a, an exam that is consistent or concerning for an ACL is to look at imaging. This is an MRI. You, uh, you start with an x-ray and look for associated uh, injuries. But moving to the MRI, this is a normal uh, MRI of an ACL. Uh, this is not. And so that's definitely the next step. The majority of tears are going to be in the mid-substance uh, of the ACL itself. And bony avulsions, except in the uh, pediatric or adolescent population, are very rare. So again, this is the normal ACL that we see on the MRI, and this is the abnormal. This is an intraoperative picture of that normal ACL going from the tibia to the femur. And this you can see, you have the femur here, this is the notch, and there is no ACL which would go right here. So when we look surgically, uh, what is the, the treatment that we're doing for ACL? And really the gold standard is ACL reconstruction. Uh, repair, or actually trying to fix the, the uh, ligament, is not successful. So there are many different grafts that you can use, but this is the general idea that you're taking a graft from the tibia to the femur and you're reconstructing uh, the uh, ACL. How do we choose what graft to use? That's probably the biggest uh, question that patients have, is what graft should I use? And uh, go, graft selection really depends, is this a primary or secondary surgery? Is this a, a revision reconstruction? What are the functional demands uh, of the player? Are they a football player? Are they a young athlete? Uh, what is their dedication or their time availability to recovery? Uh, what is their de degree of arthrosis? And what is the overall condition of the joint? And the ideal graft, should reproduce the complex anatomy of the ACL and have complete biological incorporation. It should also have equivalent strength and stiffness of the native ACL uh, and allow for strong uh, and secure fixation. And of course, should be ready, readily available. So the different options are bone, tendon, bone, and that's taking the tendon from the patella and uh, bone from the, uh, from the patella tendon, bone from the patella as well as from the tibia. There's the hamstring, uh, central quad, which is not as commonly used, and then there are allograft options, um, as well as prosthetics. And at this point, except for some recent studies uh, in Europe, all prosthetics have really shown uh, high failure rates, and so they're not an option uh, at this point. So what are the advantages of some of the graphs? graphs? The bone patella bone, uh, or bone tendon bone, really the greatest advantage is the bone bone healing is uh, much faster than you'll see with the uh, tendon bone healing, and it's six to eight weeks. You have strong immediate fixation uh, and good stiffness of the graft. There's a low incidence of osteolysis, uh, and you don't have any graft rejection because this is the patient's own tissue if you're using an auto graft. Um, what are the disadvantages? The greatest disadvantage is the morbidity of the harvest, and that's pain at the patella, patellofemoral syndrome, painful knee, uh, kneeling. So if you have a patient who their job or their life requires kneeling, this probably is not the um, option for them. Or if they've had a history of patella symptoms in the past, it's something to consider uh, carefully when deciding what graft to use for them. The hamstring is another uh, autograft option where you're taking the patient's own hamstring tendons, uh, two of them, and using them as a graft. What are the advantages here? The strongest and stiffest, um, uh, depending on the uh, type of fixation, it is shown to be 138% stronger uh, than a 10 millimeter um, bone patella bone graft. Uh, there's decreased harvest morbidity uh, compared to the uh, bone tendon bone. And there's questionably increased uh, ease of rehab over the uh, bone patel bone, and that there are a lot of therapists here could probably uh, talk about that issue. What are the disadvantages? Again, going back to the healing, the bone tendon healing is, takes much longer. So if you have an athlete that needs, um, you know, has a goal to get back faster, your healing will be slower, and you have to possibly take your, your rehab uh, at a, a slower pace. So you're looking at 8 to 12 weeks before you have real incorporation. Uh, you do have some hamstring weakness uh, after surgery. Uh, and there's definitely a learning curve if, uh, if uh, surgeons haven't done this. And there's a question of loosening over time. And that probably is more of a historical concern with uh, earlier fixation um, devices. 
So the most important factors for successful surgery of ACL reconstruction are optimal position, optimal tensioning, uh, secure fixation of the graft, post-op protection, and of course, post-op therapy. Uh, without that, the surgery itself really, um, you know, is doomed to fail. So what are some of the more uh, hot issues in 2009? I think graft orientation and single versus double bundle are probably issues that um, uh, patients will become aware of. Why is graft orientation so important? Uh, we used to uh, look at the uh, reconstruction of the ACL, and this is uh, a guide wire going in, and that's sort of the orientation that we would put it in. You can see that up here on the femur, that's about the 11 o'clock position. Uh, and that's what we used to do. And that provided excellent um, anterior to posterior stability, but did not provide rotational stability. And when you look more recently, we're looking down more at the 10 o'clock position, which is providing us better uh, uh, rotational as well as anterior uh, and posterior stability. So the second um, sort of issue is single versus double technique. When you look at the uh, reconstruction with a single bundle, and that's uh, most of those graphs that I showed you were, were single bu bundle, this is the location on the femur, and this is the location on the tibia. And then when you look at the double bundle, you see that you're actually recreating those two bundles that I showed you in the beginning, uh, both on the, the tibia and the femur. So what are the benefits and the drawbacks of both of these? Here are a couple studies recently that, uh, that prospectively looked at them. So uh, Strike et al. in 2008 looked at 49 patients. It was prospective and randomized, and they did single bundle versus double bundle. And the important factor here is that they put the uh, single bundle in that 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock position, so they're helping to provide that rotational stability. Uh, and the double bundle, they used four tunnels they found no difference basically in any of their outcomes in um, the KT-1000, the test we looked at earlier, uh, and any of the patient satisfaction and outcome studies. However, Sion et al. in 2008 used navigation, computer navigation, looking at double versus single, um, and they found that the double had greater anterior po and posterior stability as well as rotational stability. But the uh, criticism of this study is their single bundle ACLs were at the 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock position. And so we know from other studies that that does not provide the same rotational stability. Another study um, from 2008 was prospective and randomized again, single versus double bundle. Uh, and they noticed that the double bundle um, had better AP and rotational stability as well. So it's definitely a question. Uh, the double bundle is more complicated. There's certainly a learning curve, and the question of whether it's clinically significant for the patient, I think, is something that's yet to be discovered. Um, so what can we do to prevent ACL injuries, which is probably the most important thing we can do to advance uh, ACL injuries at this time? Uh, the first is look at the shoe um, surface interface. And to this uh, t uh, date, there's no proven um, there's no, it's not proven to be a significant contributor, although there is some data to suggest it, most really does not. Um, is bracing prophylactically a benefit? Um, bracing has shown to reduce collateral ligament injuries, and so that's uh, injury to the medial or lateral, lateral collateral ligaments, but not to the ACL. And hormonal, there's no evidence to support that we should modify uh, female activity during certain uh, periods of their menstrual cycle um, in order to prevent uh, injuries. So the most important thing that we can do in prevention is really the neuromuscular training. Uh, and we know that the physical training improves the neuromuscular efficiency. It increases strength, agility, and proprioception. It alters that quadriceps hamstring ratio. Um, we improve jumping and landing mechanics. And we um, really focus on proper alignment.